Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good night, and welcome or welcome back to Crash Course Economics. It's great to see you all. Uh, I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. You can uh, say who you are, your name, and where you're from. My name is uh, Sarah. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. And my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. Behind the scenes, we have a team consisting of Jeremy Krollsmith, who is a web developer, and he designed our awesome website, Kees Hudig from globalinfo.nl, and uh, Jenny Pannebecker, a communications officer at SOMO, who are working very hard to make this series a success. So uh, I'll briefly introduce also Crash Course itself. Um, we are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations, and we united at the start of the corona crisis because we wanted to understand what's going on and reflect on ideas and solutions to solve the problems uh, that came with the crisis. And Crash Course itself is a, an interactive platform. It's designed to open up the debate on how we can move out of the current crisis and also make the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. Uh, in order to do that, we're inviting global experts to break down complex issues, uh, mainly uh, finance and macroeconomics, and to make them accessible to all so that we can together shape our economic system in a just and democratic way. And our goal is to democratize complex knowledge and provide you with the necessary tools you need to change the world. So we're organizing a webinar every two weeks until uh, mid-December. And uh, useful for you to know is that there will be a recording of this webinar and also a podcast version and a transcript. Uh, the recording of the former webinar with uh, Eva Karwowski is already available online on our website. Uh, so, Rodrigo, can you tell us something about the former and the current series? Uh, yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, so although it may seem all random, there is a certain logic to our uh, series and, and, and episodes. Uh, so, our first series uh, was on uh, central banks and monetary policy um, this is something that is uh, grown very much uh, in importance since the start of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, their response uh, has been well very influential in shaping uh, the structures we have around us today uh, and our second series is on how um, there's a debt crisis brewing uh, across the global south, across developing countries. Uh, we've had three episodes before, focusing more on uh, the background stories, on uh, so what are the, the, the underlying structures that have been out there uh, developing in the past uh, decades. Um, and today we continue uh, with another perspective uh, from South Africa uh, and also uh, more from the ground uh, to see how uh, responses are or should be. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rodrigo. And uh, you'll have the honor to introduce today's speaker in a second. I'll just tell the audience uh, a brief uh, setup of today. So uh, first, the speaker will be introduced and he will have about 15 till 20 minutes to uh, present his view. Uh, he'll give a presentation and thereafter, Rodrigo and I have uh, prepared some questions for him. So uh, this round of questions will take another 15 till 20 minutes. And finally, it's up to you. Uh, there's another 15, 20 minutes uh, round of questions from your side. And those will be read out loud by Rodrigo and me. Uh, you can put all your questions in the special uh, Q&A uh, window or tab, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just put your question there. And if you like a question, you can endorse it by putting a thumbs up. And in that way, uh, the most favored or endorsed questions will appear at uh, the top. So it will make it easier for me and Rodrigo to select those questions which you find most uh, interesting. So Rodrigo, um, it's up to you to introduce today's speaker. Yes, well, um, we are very happy today uh, to have uh, Dominic Brown uh, with us today. Uh, so uh, Dominique he is uh, an economic justice uh, program manager at the Alternative Information and Development Center in South Africa. Uh, this center was formed in uh, 1996 in response to the democratic uh, transition in South Africa. Um, yeah, and has been working on uh, basically the challenges uh, that were brought 
throughout this period uh, and, and in trying to seek a greater social justice, economic justice. Uh, Dominique has been working on uh, many different themes, uh, economic, financial issues, uh, but also on uh, issues related to climate change. Uh, and we are very, very much interested in hearing his perspective uh, from his organization from South Africa to uh, current events uh, and how the, well, the, the global crisis is unfolding across the global south. So, uh, Dominique, would you like to put on your camera and uh, give a presentation, please? Thank you, Rodrigo, and um, thank you, Sara, and to Crash Course Economics. I think this is an excellent initiative, and I'm really glad to be able to participate. I've watched uh, previous inputs and I find them to be excellent resources and I've shared them with others too. And fortunately for me, I can build a lot on um, what Andrew Fisher and Iwa uh, Kowalski have uh, said in, their, in the previous webinars that you've held with them. And so I'll build a lot on that. But maybe before uh, talking about um, or going to that, let me start by saying um, that AIDC, the Alternative Information and Development Center, as you say, we, we started in 1996. And when we formed, um, one of the major issues at the time was a abandoning of a more redistributive macroeconomic framework. And one of the main reasons for this um, advanced by the post-apartheid government was that the residual apartheid debt needed to be uh, paid off. And this was um, going to require greater spending on debt costs. And what we have seen at the time that this crowded out investment into the real economy. Very early on in the post-apartheid transition, and this had major uh, economic impacts um, that we see now in the long run. This, but what we also found was that there was good cause to demand the repudiation or the cancellation of that debt based on the fact that it was odious um, or in line with the doctrine of odious debt from 1927, which is basically if uh, any debt was taken out um, with awareness of the creditors that this debt would be against the interests of the majority of the population um, and you or used in the means for the self-interest of a few, then this debt is actually illegitimate. And so on that basis, um, we thought that this debt should be scrapped. Uh, but with many things, we quickly came to recognize that um, you can't change things solely on the power of the uh, of those of the ideas alone or the concrete uh, alternatives and solutions that you present. What's really required is um, the building of movements and a counter power to be able to advance a more progressive, a more redistributive uh, political agenda. So that's really how we came into the work on debt. Um, and now, since the pandemic, we're seeing an emergence of a debt crisis, not only in South Africa, but globally, as many countries have had to borrow in order to finance some of the uh, alleviation measures required to deal with the hard lockdowns implemented in response to the uh, pandemic and to so-called flatten the curve. And so even though many of us on the left said we shouldn't be borrowing and that there's other ways of financing the, the needs required to deal with the pandemic, and I'll come back to this in a bit, um, we turned to the IMF and many of us uh, got our uh, special drawing rights. Um, and in this way, it was supposedly a means to alleviate some of the major fiscal and economic impacts um, induced by the pandemic. And so um, Rodrigo in a previous webinar uh, with 
uh, Andrew Fisher uh, was alluding to the fact that what's different about this debt crisis compared to uh, many other debt crises that we have seen, particularly in, particularly in the global south, uh, before, well, in the first instance, we're seeing that it's debt rising um, not only in the global south, but also in the global north. But more uh, particularly, the issue of this debt is coming at a time when there are much bigger uh, challenges that we're facing, not only uh, at the country level, but globally. Um, and of course, many of us have seen uh, graphics like this showing the looming and current uh, ecological crisis the, uh, that we are all facing. And when we see the rising debt within the context of needing to deal with the ecological crisis and the uh, uh, amount of financial resources required to pay for a just transition um, that many progressives have been calling for um, around the world before the idea of the Green New Deal came in. And of course, I think we need to interrogate this Green New Deal and, and what it means uh, for, for the global South. But that's a, it's another question. So when we, when we think about the finances needed um, for this type of transition, but not only in terms of dealing with the ecological crisis, but of course, we're facing multiple and intersecting crises uh, around the world, but of course, exacerbated in countries of the global South, um, where the, of course, the ecological crisis is at the pinnacle of all of this, but we see deepening unemployment, growing inequality and precariousness within the labor force, um, growing hunger, uh, malnourishment, et cetera. So all of these crises are intersecting and we effectively find that these crises, think this, these crises are all rooted within the deep neoliberal paradigm and a paradigm that prioritizes a financial economy. And of course, Eva um, in her presentation maps this out um, extremely well. So this is the, the situation that we're facing and even a, I don't know, a, maybe a Keynesian uh, reformist type like Joseph Stiglitz um, is in line with the idea that you can't squeeze uh, water out of the stone and that without debt restructuring and increased financial assistance to developing countries and emerging economies and fast, he says, there can be no sustainable uh, recovery. But of course, um, whilst the IMF managing director blames the power of private capital and private creditors um, for what we have seen many countries following the pandemic implementing uh, greater fiscal consolidation or austerity programs, the IMF themselves um, and their staff have backed these fiscal consolidation measures um, including wage bill restraints and other spending cuts. So what we're seeing is in fact, an intensification of a neoliberal agenda. And in response to the pandemic and the growing uh, debt crisis, it's full cycle back to uh, a site structural adjustment programs, even maybe of a different kind. And once again, we see the prioritization of debt service costs and the crowding out of resources for finance and social services, as well as investing in public infrastructure and improving domestic productive capacity. We see the intensification of a neoliberal macroeconomic framework um, and the treasury worldview. And included in this is increased commercialization, further pushes for the privatization of public enterprises and public services, and further deregulation of capital and financial markets. And so this in effect will just result in an entrenchment of a dependency uh, paradigm 
And of course, I think Andrew Fisher uh, points out very well in his presentation how this dependency relates quite intrinsically to the issue of financial flows uh, in order to uh, finance the, um, the current account deficits within the balance of payments. And even when he indicated that there are trade surpluses, whilst also indicating that there's large differences within uh, developing countries and the global south. But thirdly, and I think extremely fundamentally, we also see this continuation of an extractivist mode of development or so-called development and a perpetuation of fossil fuels economies, particularly in global south who are dependent on extracting um, commodities uh, for, and through an export oriented growth um, in line with a, a neoliberal macroeconomic framework. And this really is only going to result in the continuation and the deepening of the ecological crisis, but particularly in global South countries where uh, extractivist economies are so prevalent. So really we do need, um, as many have been calling for, um, debt cancellation and um, in October following or around about this time when the IMF had a meeting where after this meeting we see this consolidation of a neoliberal and austerity agenda, um, more than 500 organizations have called for uh, immediate debt cancellation. And of course this will be vital towards being able to um, not only pay for the types of social services required, but also create the type of space for further investment within the, um, towards a deindustrialization program in a low carbon economy. And I heard uh, Andrew Fisher's critique of the way industrialization connects quite intrinsically to the financial economy. But I think we must see I, I see it slightly differently in that the investment permanently goes within these extractivist economies, economies and mega projects often tainted with corruption. And these uh, big commodity and extractivist sectors have become increasingly capital intensive over time. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the manufacturing sectors within many of the global south economies, they have been deeply uprooted um, or there's a massive exploitation of wages um, happening where it is taking place. So when you uh, connect these issues, then you uh, re recognize that the issue of debt is not an issue uh, in and of itself, but it in fact connects and creates a multiplicity of issues and behind it is fundamentally a kind of macroeconomic framework within which debt is a key aspect to drive uh, further neoliberal reforms. And we're seeing this, I think, in a dynamic interplay between states themselves who are keen on pushing sometimes a fiscal consolidation agenda. Of course, this is not across the board. Um, and I mean, more generally, in developing countries. Um, I know there's been massive quantitative easing in many global north countries and the dropping of interest rates to very low and sometimes even negative. But the opposite is in fact taking place within developing countries where uh, generally domestic interest rates are extremely high as a means of attracting further uh, financial inflows. And of course, as um, uh, Andrew Fisher indicated that this results in an exacerbation or a vicious cycle of dependency through the repayment of remittances and profits and dividends to those non-resident investors. Um, and so a real break uh, from this is going to be required in order to be able to deal with, uh, with the crisis that we, that we face. And of course, debt is a key aspect of that. So at the moment, we at the crossroads and uh, we can, we are 
currently moving in the direction of a greater entrapment, a greater dependency and uh, an efficient cycle of debt, um, whilst at the same time looking towards a uh, ecological catastrophe. So the big question then is um, how do we, sorry, uh, the point I was trying to make early on was the connection between the nations who are happy to push uh, fiscal consolidation, but also uh, in the global South countries, but also um, the dynamic between uh, multi-national uh, institutions and international international finance institutions, and the, and the role that they play in helping to legitimize um, austerity agendas when certain nation states are happy to push it, and in other instances, um, the IMF um, and other. Uh, international finance institutions effectively force it. But even if they don't, the, the international economic architecture um, is so powerful that uh, even without those institutions, even without nation states, it often seems to be the only course of action. And uh, to be able to go to the path of freedom then requires a massive break within the way uh, things are currently done. To do this, um, and this is really the, the main point, we um, have to go back to the kinds of building of counter power. Um, but unlike, or not unlike, but it's not possible, I think, given the state of social movements and popular forces, to focus on debt solely in and of itself. Um, but rather to look at what uh, movements are currently uh, fighting for, what they are resisting, their struggles, and using that as a basis to connect it to other macroeconomic uh, issues, including uh, issues of debt and how it links directly uh, to their issues and the issues that they're fighting for. So being able to, for instance, uh, win the demand for the right to say no, which many uh, indigenous communities who are fighting against extractivism are calling for would require a much broader uh, change within the macroeconomic system. It cannot be one in and of itself. Similarly, with worker struggles, um, struggles for social services, um, and many other issues. And so it's about being able to connect these many struggles um, in, on the one hand, and show how uh, they are connected to these broader issues, but also how these issues are connected to each other. Um, this is another key aspect. And so that movements and organization who are fighting on different or resisting on different fronts are not able to be uh, fronted up against each other in this process. Um, and rather that they see uh, the unity within their struggles and in so doing, holding greater solidarity. Key aspects of this is through um, popular education, um, demystifying economics, uh, doing the types of things that crash course economics is busy doing, which I think is key aspects of connecting struggles, but also developing a deeper consciousness in relation to these struggles and in response to them. Critically, however, these struggles cannot be won within countries, within countries alone. They have to, they have to be uh, connected across countries, within regions, um, continents, um, and across um, even global south and global north divides. And in this instance, there's many lessons that we should be drawing from the Jubilee uh, 2000 uh, campaign. Um, calling for the cancellation of debt um, and using these experiences and lessons to inform um, the kinds of responses that we are able to uh, put up in, in a context of growing debt, but also in a context of uh, many other crises that we are facing. And in that regard, I think we should uh, reigniting the demand for saying that we don't owe and we don't pay as we 
push forward for the cancellation of, of debts and for a break from, from a neoliberal financial capitalist system. Right, there we are back again. Uh, thank you so much, Dominic. There is Rodrigo. Um, Rodrigo, I believe you have the first question for Dominic and a really cool presentation with a lot of uh, visuals I really liked. So thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. I think it really provided a, a very good overview of all of the elements that, that we would like to talk about. Unfortunately, we only have half a bit more than half an hour so I, I hope we, 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 can, uh, we can address some of the issues. But I, I think that the, for me, the most important um, graphics are, were the, yeah, the, the, this idea that the COVID-19 pandemic is, is a relatively small tsunami and behind that are the real uh, fundamental issues that, uh, well, that we are not even starting to, to talk about. Uh, and of course, this idea from uh, the, this quote from Stiglitz uh, that you cannot, uh, I don't know how, how you said it, uh, squeeze water out of a stone. Um, that, that's, that, that's, that's a question I, I would like to, um, to continue with, because this uh, squeezing water out of a stone is, of course, something that, well, it, it is, we have been seeing for the last 40 years. Um, something that is co coming back in each of these episodes uh, is that there's a long history of debt crisis. Uh, the, 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 the 82 Mexican debt crisis uh, spreading all across Latin America, Africa, the, the, the structural adjustment pro programs, the crisis in the 1990s, 94, the Mexican tequila crash, the 97 Asian crisis, uh, 99 Moscow, well, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to, the, to our current age. Um, and I, I would like to talk about the differences uh, again, but, but then focus on, on one aspect uh, and just wanted to see your perspective. Um, so I, I, I want to focus on the debtor-creditor relations, the, the, the different type of debtors and creditors. In the, in the 1980s, the most important actors uh, responsible for the, for the crisis uh, were banks uh, and, and, well, Part of financial globalization is that finance has become more market-based, bond markets have become more important. And so what we see now, of course, is that bond markets are is is where everything is. Most of the problems are when, it, when we're talking about the debt crisis. And this is on the one hand quite anonymous, but also dominated by these extremely large investment funds, uh, BlackRock, uh, State Street, Vanguard. So my, my question basically is, does it matter that uh, this, 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 the, these very large investment funds that are so dominant globally, uh, from the perspective you think of South Africa when it comes confronting this debt crisis, uh, trying to seek solutions? So, I, in the first instance, I mean, so this is it relates to, of course, as you're pointing out, the deepening of a financial paradigm and uh, an increase of speculative uh, financial flows, and now, particularly in relation to uh, bond markets. Now, I I think that it matters to an extent. Uh, and the reason why I say to an extent is because whether it's the big banks or big investors, ultimately it's in relation to building up finance capital, okay? Um, in terms of the why it matters more is in terms of who we need to be targeting the impacts that it will have and the interests that's in relation to fighting uh, uh, the, these big investors, okay? And I think in that regard, um, it is more complicated, it's more complex as a result. Um, and more than that, I, I do think that there's also political space though to target those things because of those institutions because of the detrimental 
impact that it has on nation states. And so if you look at the idea of these non-resident financiers and the repayment of uh, interest to them, uh, if we are able to convince the general public how this is against their interests and that there are alternative means of financing, um, I think that that can be a way of, of breaking from, from the entrenchment of, of these big capital investors. I don't know if that, if that answers your question. Yes, yeah. Maybe Sarah can continue with... Um... Yes, I'm happy to. Uh, and thanks again for, for your great presentation. Also really cool that you uh, uh, took the effort of uh, watching episodes uh, of Crash Course and then referring to them because it really uh, helps in uh, building up the knowledge and uh, making it more uh, cumulative. So thank you for that. Um, I was wondering, so another topic we frequently ask, which is also related um, to what Rodrigo just addressed is about good debt versus bad debt. So that also, of course, corresponds to who owns the debt. Um, and uh, regarding South Africa, uh, you uh, write that debt service costs at the moment are the fastest growing budget item in the national budget, right? Which is, I, I guess, quite shocking taking into account the level of poverty and inequality uh, in your country. Uh, maybe you can elaborate on that uh, a little bit and then also say something on uh, the question of good and bad debt, because it seems that South Africa is suffering from uh, bad debt, uh, being also disproportionately dependent on uh, foreign direct investments and uh, foreign capital flows more in general. Uh, and then maybe I'll ask one more question, but this is, I think, for now, uh, a big one already. So in terms of the first question, um, in debt service costs has now been the fastest growing um, budget line since 2012. And it was in 2012 um, that South Africa reintroduced uh, main budget expenditure lines. In other words, a reintroduction of a fiscal consolidation agenda and the main reasons um, for this at the time was uh, growing debt in relation to borrowing to finance the um, uh, investment in our public enterprises, particularly um, our energy utility, where we borrowed quite extensively to finance two major uh, coal-fired power stations. So it's in this context that we see the increase in debt. And most recently, we see an intensification of this um, as we now not only see a growth in the, in the level of debt service costs as a proportion of the overall budget, but we also see the, um, the calls to reduce the public sector wage bill, uh, massive cuts to uh, infrastructural budgets, um, and effectively real, in, real cuts to the main budget expenditure uh, over the medium framework. So, so that's what we're seeing now. And I think what we are seeing here is not unique uh, to South Africa. It's, it's a phenomenon that's happening elsewhere too. Uh, but it's also coupled with uh, a push to a, so it comes with conditionalities from the state to effectively uh, further privatize electricity generation within the South African economy. And of course, this will exacerbate not only energy poverty, but it will also uh, exacerbate unemployment, as you'll see many retrenchments uh, within the energy utility, which should be reformed, um, but also through the, um, as a result of the privatization of the renewable energy sector, this is how it will be done. Uh, we won't see the maximum, maximum potential being able to uh, create jobs uh, through a, a renewable energy program. But moreover, what we found is that um, globally, the private investment in renewable energies has hit a brick, brick wall um, through what we call the three fall effect. And that is basically to say that as bidding windows um, for uh, renewables uh, comes down uh, in terms of being able to achieve power purchase agreements, 
we also see that uh, whilst um, the level of, or, or the rate rather, of capital expenditure costs for the for renewables hasn't fallen at the same speed as that of the, the bidding prices, has meant that there's a declining rate in profitability and in fact stagnating levels of investment um, globally. So this is gonna be a major problem. <laughs> So we're seeing this privatization agenda mixed with an austerity agenda coming as a result of this. And, and, and the debt service costs is one of the key issues. The second thing was about um, good and bad, good, good and or bad debt. So in fact, the majority of South Africans' debt is domestic debt, uh, ironically. Um, and there's even large portions of the the public enterprises debt that's held by domestic enterprises. However, the mix of foreign to domestic debt of the public enterprises is more towards foreign debt than of debt denominated in foreign currency to be precise. So, um, so South Africa is actually in quite a good position in that regard. Um, and the issue of the capital flows is uh, in, a, in a related but unrelated uh, a matter. So in the first instance, we can in fact um, reduce our debt service costs simply by um, having governmental institutions speaking to each other and providing uh, greater concessionary finance at below market interest rates um, within governmental institutions. One example um, we have made is that um, the Public Investment Corporation, which is the asset manager of the government's employees pension fund. So that's all the workers, government workers' pension is contributed to this thing, um, is heavily invested. First of all, it's um, within it's in surpluses. The accumulated reserves is well over what's required to pay for current and or future liabilities. Okay. But uh, more than two thirds of this accumulated reserves is invested in the financial economy. Um, so we're saying that in fact, this should be redirected um, and I think this phenomenon, once again, it's across, it's international. Um, uh, maybe with some, uh, there's also the sovereign wealth funds, of course, is another example of this. This is a kind of sovereign wealth fund that's heavily invested in, in the financial economy. So we're saying uh, we can use the, these funds to purchase the government bonds um, as a means of um, so, and at concessionary interest rates as a, as a means of reducing um, pressures of, of on, on debt repayments, because we don't have to pay that much to foreign creditors. Of course, now we took out a loan from IMF and that uh, poses some issues, but I think I mean, this loan wasn't required in the first instance. And that relates to the issue of the balance of payments and the issue of capital flows, which was the third um, issue um, you raised. And so um, what we have seen is that since the post-apartheid transition, um, we've in line with the greater global integration to the uh, global economy, um, we've not only deregulated trade markets, we've also massively deregulated capital markets and um, reduced uh, capital and exchange controls. Um, so it's been heavily uh, uh, reduced over the past two decades. And so what we've seen is uh, over the, the late 90s, early 2000s, a massive inflow of portfolio um, investment and then followed by foreign direct investment. And as a result of this, we have had um, a structural balance of payment problems um, in that we have since had to pay a huge amount of um, a huge amount of money in the form of uh, dividends, interest payments, um, and profits repatriated to those non-resident investors. Um, so this is really where the, the issue of the, the capital flows uh, comes in. And we've had to, so Africa has quite a high domestic interest rate in order to attract uh, greater levels of financial inflows. And so we have this massive cycle of dependency as a result. And in fact, um, when we look at the uh, external debt, a large, or not a large, but a good proportion of it would be related to uh, these non-resident uh, investors and the uh, interest repayments 
required on that. So um, a shift to a finish year, a shift to a uh, uh, very implement stricter uh, capital and exchange controls uh, is a critical as, uh, issue for us and something that we think is critical in kind of delinking from the um, worms of the and pressures of the of the global financial economy. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to uh, f uh, follow up on that um, because I, I, I have a question about uh, what the role of social movements uh, and NGOs, uh, left leaning political parties, um, could or should be. Um, what we see is that um, yeah, the, 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 the crisis, the debt crisis in the 1980s, well, produced quite a strong movement in the 1990s, uh, perhaps culminating in the, in the 2000 Jubilee. But uh, before that, uh, of course, in response to the Asian crisis, uh, the attack movement uh, here in Europe, especially in France, uh, grew, uh, putting really at the forefront this, this whole issue of, of, of debt and, and, and financialization. Um, and and at, uh, at, at the last, or well, not, at, and we're one crisis further in Argentina, but at the 2001 crisis, um, yeah, the, the, the IMF was almost there to really institute some sort of a mechanism to deal with the bankruptcy of states, something that uh, uh, UNCTAD had been uh, asking since the 1970s. So I have the impression that in around 2000, the early 2000s, um, these international institutions, international financial architecture was much more there in line with pro progressive ideas. There was a much stronger movement. The demands were much fiercer. Uh, it was much more at the top of the agenda. And now, uh, if we look at what, uh, what has been coming out, uh, it is really, it's, it's a non-solution. Uh, uh, stopping the payment for some countries for a very limited time, that, that, that's really a non-solution to this existential crisis. So, and again, the privatization and austerity policies putting in place. So, so what, what, what in your, your view should be done to really, well, regain this upper hand? You know, the, um, I think this question, like many questions when people want to know what do you do, um, you, you can come up with ideas that says we can tinker here or there, okay? We can uh, try carbon pricing, for example, to deal with the ecological crisis. We all know these are non-solutions, as you say. Um, and we also know that when we speak to people, many of them te technocrats uh, and so on, they say, uh, well, we have to be practical or pragmatic, okay? Um, even this idea of allowing the market to win a renewable energy transition, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not going to happen. A renewable energy transition is not inevitable. Uh, we need uh, massive levels of investment. We need some kind of planning. Um, there's many aspects that's going to be required. Now, like debt, uh, the moratorium on debt repayments, as you say, for a very short period of time is not going to cut it, okay? And this idea that neoliberal as neoliberalism has ended um, uh, is shows that the, the very fact that the, these types of small kinds of reforms are being implemented is indicative of the fact that neoliberalism has not ended. Um, the idea that the idea was shared in 2008, 2009 massive levels of state spending, uh, quantitative easing happened, particularly in the global north, uh, to get out of the financial crisis. Many were saying neoliberalism has ended. And um, we're seeing the same thing uh, being, said, being said now. And it's quite naive because, uh, I mean, we're seeing, in fact, the exact opposite of it. We're seeing an entrenchment of a neoliberal agenda. So if we want to have real solutions like debt cancellation, if we want to have real solutions 
to the ecological uh, crisis. Um, it's going to require um, a rebuilding of movements. And I agree with you when you say that um, progressive forces are in the way in that, in fact, um, if we look at when, where progressive popular forces were a couple of decades ago, much stronger, even in South Africa, around the world, this is a major problem. But at the same time, we, we do see embers, uh, beginnings of new movements, new organizations. We're seeing in the global south, many indigenous people standing up against um, extractivism, against the stealing of their land, um, reclaiming uh, indigenous lands. I think we're seeing um, the beginnings of uh, young people saying they want a different future and that they can't go to school because of the ecological crisis. Um, we're seeing movements for black lives and we can be critical of all of these movements saying, you know, as the left, we can often sit with our hands in our pockets and critique um, the state of movements that these movements are not anti-capitalist enough. They're not socialist enough. They're not anti-establishment enough. They're not dealing with race in the right way. They're not dealing with gender, all of these things. We can do that. Um, but whilst we're doing that, they're building. Um, so I think it's critical that we, we were them um, in building. Um, and whilst we're there, we don't sit there as you would uncritically. We ask questions, we engage, um, try and connect issues, um, as I was saying in the presentation, building with different movements. Um, and hopefully in this way, we can see the re-emergence re of um, strong left popular movements movements that recognize that they won't be able to win without international solidarity. Um, and, and unless we do this with a great deal of urgency, of course, and with nuances and understandings, um, then, and also recognizing that there's no end to this types of transition that we need, then, um, yeah, I guess we, we, we're not gonna be able to make it. We have very little time left given uh, the IPCC reports, many other uh, points. But I mean, also just in terms of the social crisis that we're seeing, and I think Rodrigo, that's the point about um, uh, Stiglitz's quote about squeezing water out of a stone. As you say, we are seeing that, and we're seeing that in a case where many people can't bear it anymore, right? Um, the socioeconomic conditions that we're facing in the global South for some time, and now growing in the global north too, um, is meaning that we are at a, pre a precipice of sorts. Yeah, thank you so much, Dominic. I remember that I think it was also uh, former finance minister Varoufakis of Greece who said the same thing. You cannot squeeze, uh, maybe he said something uh, out of a lemon, but it, it, along the same lines uh, when it was, uh, you know, the the peak of the Greek uh, crisis, where also the, well, the country in the global north was hit, I think, by the same kind of austerity measures that the global south is already dealing with for decades. Uh, so there's like 10 minutes left, more or less. So I propose we move on to the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, there's one at the top by uh, Miriam van der Stichelen, and she refers to the Zambia case. So her question is, in the Zambia debt crisis or default, the private bondholders are also asking reforms from the government. Is that worse than IMF as these private investors, which have been speculating on these bonds and are not accountable? NGOs can target those bondholders in campaigns, but should there not be regulation of those private bondholders? Absolutely. I think, um, and I think this is where capital and exchange controls comes in strongly. Once again, when non-resident bondholders can repatriate profits, what profits must be used for within a country? Um, I think there's many regulations that you can uh, put on those uh, private non-resident non investors in relation to uh, how and um, how the investments are used and when they get uh, the returns on investment and uh, the levels of returns on investment. So I do think, yes, it's an important point um, that you make, but I, I still think that there's a need to, where possible, prioritize uh, domestic uh, resource mobilization as far as possible 
And I think that in line with this um, repatriating large levels of profits back to Global South countries is a key aspect uh, in this regard. And of course, we know, and I'm sure that seems like quite a, a uh, up to speed audience, that there's large levels of illicit financial flows uh, and not only illicit financial flows, uh, base erosion and profit shifting that's taking place from developing countries and particularly extractivist based economies, putting an end to this um, would also be a, a way of putting an end to the way these private investors are in fact, um, yeah, reducing the resources within nation states. Just a, a, a very brief follow-up question. Um, this, I, I, I completely agree with you that, uh, yeah, domestic resource mobilization through, yeah, tackling uh, tax evasion and avoidance should should be prioritized and is being stopped through the OECD measures that are also a non-solution to this. Yeah. But but, but if we go, if we go back to the the Zambian case. Uh, then um, it's, it seems striking that there's, there's, uh, there seems to be a new type of dynamic visible there. And it is that in previous debt crisis, of course, with public private debt bondholders, uh, for, for example, if we take the case of Argentina, you, you saw that uh, yeah, at the end, even if everyone agrees, you still had these vulture funds uh, getting their way. Um, but now we, we see that there's also a component uh, of Chinese debt, uh, and now it, it seems uh, as if there's these three different components, and everyone is looking at the other one, saying, "Well, you should, you should give in, you should give in." And in the end, it it, it seems to me it's only complicating the matter more and, and perhaps uh, worsening the situation than improving the situation. I mean, you can uh, decide on your own to no longer to default on those payments. I mean, of course, that puts you up in a very difficult position globally. Uh, but as you were saying, and I think this goes back to the prior point now, and this is where the pragmatists will say I'm wrong, is because they would say, well, maybe we need to find ways of looking for which finance, which external finance would come at the best rates with the least conditionalities, okay, mm -hmm. with the most transparency. That would be the, and then take it on the basis on that regard. I think that most of these uh, multi or international finance institutions, be it uh, IMF or uh, National Development Bank, uh, the, whichever big bank, uh, the New Development Bank, uh, and so on, it, you can entrench yourself within this dependency path. Um, and so you really need to break from that. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll continue so, with another. Sorry. So I think you need to cancel the dates, but you won't be able to do it without a massive change. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really would like to continue this, but there's more questions waiting. So I'll just continue uh, with them. Um, so we, we hopefully we can address them within the hour. Uh, so the, the, uh, there's another question from uh, Kees Tat, Kees Hudig, who is... Uh, part of the crash course team. Um, the fact that the coming COVID crisis will be global and also will hit the rich countries hard, um, will, that, will that not mean that they, uh, those rich countries and their banks, will do everything they can to make the countries in the global south pay? They will resist debt cancellation even more than before. Yeah. Uh, probably, um, but there's also people within these global North countries who are suffering as a result of it. Um, so I don't think, so whilst yes, um, nation states within the global North would want uh, those repayments of those debts and would not want, but particularly the US, I think, uh, would be strong against against any moves towards debt cancellation. Um, even, even if Biden, I think Biden recently came out and said he wants some, some debt cancellation. I'm not sure if it was student debts or mortgage debts. Um, so, but, so I think the solidarities between the peoples of the South and the peoples of the North, I mean, 
fighting for a more redistributive system, which France, Germany, the US, the UK, maybe to an extent is providing better to the countries in the South, but uh, they're not doing it either. Do you see, well, if I can just briefly add to that, do you see any options or strategies or success factors that might lead to a more coherent and, and solidarity-based uh, global movement against that and austerity since, well, different countries from both the North and the South are suffering from the same policies, right? And the same financialization. Uh, what strategy would be effective, you think, to, to unite? It's a difficult question, and I don't have the answer. You can only speculate uh, on issues that links many countries together in a, in a strong way. Climate change could potentially be that. Um, but I mean, even the fight for greater social services, greater state spending, it seems to be, uh, and the reclaiming of the public is a fight that's becoming uh, a fight that we see uh, take place globally. But until we recognize until one, we build our movements where we are and strengthen those movements, whichever those movements may be, um, and then building the consciousness to connect them um, and building international solidarity with, on whatever basis. And I think that basis can't be determined by me, um, I think would be. So we have to build those movements. I think that's the main thing, <laughs> yeah. I have one more question here. Um... Uh, from the attendees. Um, South Africa has relatively limited uh, foreign, exchange, uh, foreign exchange debt or foreign debt. Uh, so you would expect the South African rent to do more to bring down debt service costs dramatically through rate cuts, a QE and a yield curve control. Uh, why does it so, refuse to do this? So uh, I think you mean the South African Reserve Bank um so that's the the central yeah, bank of the country um yeah. okay so yes absolutely um the central bank should in fact be playing a a more uh enabling role a more supportive role to the state and and, and to government but on the basis of uh, central bank independence um and uh, prioritization of inflation targeting um we have not seen seen that taking place. And that's because what we have seen in South Africa is a um, key members and key positions within the state have uh, key neoliberal uh, backgrounds and perspectives. But, so, yeah. But, uh, yeah, this, well, independence of central banks, uh, of course yeah. they, are, they, they are quite interdependent with market forces as we, as we have learned, but, um, uh, and the, the neoliberal dogmas of, of yeah, focusing on, on, on inflation uh, is sole uh, well issue. Uh, of course, it's, this is a global global issue, but still uh, not only in the global north, but also in the global south. For example, take uh, the case of Chile. Uh, central banks have been uh, active in, in in purchasing bonds in in, in quantitative easing. So why is it that in South Africa it is the, South, the neoliberal the neoliberal there's been a, a an intensification of a neoliberal agenda the 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 exact uh, dogma doctrine that you're talking about is entrenched and is a, a refusal to put the question of macroeconomic policy uh, so what we saw within the pandemic was that the central bank purchased uh, bonds from the secondary bond market okay but they refused to uh, buy bonds directly from the primary bond market to finance uh, uh, state debt. So this, it's, it's exactly because of that uh, neoliberal uh, treasury view that we see in line uh, or put in place firmly with the governor of the Reserve Bank, the current one, um, the finance minister, um, as well as the minister of the public enterprises, these three um, and the president are quite strong on this perspective, in spite of uh, various rhetoric. Uh, but however, the governor of the Reserve Bank and the finance minister unequivocally uh, have said before, there's no chance of capital controls, exchange controls, there's no chance of 
purchasing bonds from the primary bond market. Uh, they don't see any of these things as real options. Instead, what we saw was um, 200, uh, well, it's rent, so it's divided by some, a, an extensive amount of uh, state resources, half of the, almost half of the, of the so-called fiscal stimulus was in the form of um, government guarantees to commercial banks. Um, and so you see, you see this taking place and you don't see the, the use of the central bank uh, as a means of um, dealing with some of the financial issues. Um, yeah, I, I would really like to uh, discuss this, but maybe we will have to do that another time because, uh, yeah, I think that's really uh, to think about what a progressive... So we have come out... We have come out with uh, a number of uh, economists and political economists and wrote a public letter to the Reserve Bank to say that you have to put this issue on the table. And the only response was a non, was just a recommitment to uh, Reserve Bank independence and the prioritization of inflation targeting. Well, maybe we can put that uh, also on the, on the website uh, along this, uh, this talk. And of course, with other resources that um, well that you could make available, uh, so people can see the type of work you, uh, you're engaged in and, and and all of the different issues. Um, I, I would like to give uh, I would like to give the last few seconds to Sarah to 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 end this uh, this episode. Uh, I would like to thank you. I mean, there's so many things that we could still discuss, but the hour is, is over. Uh, so uh, hopefully we will have another time to meet. Yeah, thank you so much, Dominic. Uh, I think it was a really concrete and nice talk about being a anti-debt activist in a, in a heavily indebted currently country. Uh, and I also think what you said about uh, how we can unite, for example, referring to the climate crisis that attacks us all right and also reclaiming uh, the public and the public sector that's an important narrative i think we all need to work on so thank you so much also for for that positive and hopeful note um so uh, there will be uh, to all attendees a recording of uh, this session on our website we'll put dominic's powerpoint there as well there will be a podcast version and a transcript with references put on the website too I'd like to thank all participants um, for participating in this webinar. Uh, we've managed to, uh, I think, answer all your questions, which is, I think, a new uh, record, so that's good. Um, and lastly, uh, if you want to keep updated, please sign up uh, for our newsletter, which I'll share with you in a second. Uh, that's over here. Uh, this is our lovely website. If you scroll down, you can see all at the bottom of the sea there is here sign up for a newsletter if you click on that and leave all your contact details then uh, you'll be assured of never missing anything out on crash course so uh, to you all thanks again and um, well the next episode it's going to be a bit tight whether it will be in uh, two weeks or not but if you sign up for the newsletter you're about to find out soon so that's it for today uh, hopefully see you next time and enjoy the rest of your day.